I have tried to shape, I'm a technologist, to be honest with you. I'm a little bit often feel out of place with all these eminent social scientists, policy makers, and so forth. I hope I'll be able to connect what I do, though. I think there's a lot of alignment with what they are talking about, what you're interested in, and hopefully through the discussion, we'll be able to deepen that alignment and deepen the sort of focus that way. So I've titled the talk today, Competence, Collaboration, and Crowdsourcing, because I do think there's a really, uh, important ways in which technology is reshaping the way we build competence, the way we support effective collaboration, and the way we also, the crowdsourcing, referring to the idea of this crowdsourced liquid workforce, the way we uh, organize talent and match it to work um, at the organizational level. The one thing I hope to drive home is that when we think about how the workforce is going to change, how its needs are going to change, and how we're going to support it, we need to th think about it at those three levels. The individual level with how we build competence and support competence of the individual. The team level, how we support effective collaboration, including with distributed teams. And that crowdsource level, how we disrupt the organization and create more of a market and less of a rigid hierarchy. I'm going to mention that a few times just to make sure that, if nothing else, at least that point comes across and we can discuss that later. So just uh, I have a few slides of context about where I work and who I am, where I come from, um, and also about how we came to this uh, uh, perspective. And then I'll try to spend the bulk of the time on what we're doing about it and what our experience has been so far. So um, in terms of context, uh, I work at Accenture. It's a large consulting firm. We've got 425,000 people distributed around the world. Half of my team sits here in California and half in Bangalore. Um, so we're, we're very global, globally distributed. We are our own customers for this kind of work because we're about making teams and individuals, teams, and organizations work effectively. And our clients are also large organizations. We have about 90% of the global 2,000 that's in our client base. So my group, I, I, uh, I'm in the digital experiences group. I am the lead of the digital workforce team. So I'm focused on the workforce-facing technologies and how we help large organizations in particular leverage technology to reimagine how they get work done. Um, I have a PhD in computer science. My background's in artificial intelligence. Uh, but my passion is about the intersection of cognitive science, technology, and performance. I'm really more interested in making people smart when it comes down to it than just making computers smart. I use AI when it's relevant. But my focus is, what I'd like you to be thinking about as I'm talking is, how are we going to make people, teams, and organizations smarter, more effective. Um, a little bit of background, how we came to the perspective we're at. Before I launched the Digital Workforce Initiative a few years ago, I spent quite a bit of time with my colleagues um, in what Institute for, in Accenture's Institute for High Performance, studying how leading companies were leveraging technology to change the way work gets done. Um, there's actually, at the time especially, was a lot of controversy about whether it even was having an impact on how work gets done. And what we found was that it was, first of all. Second of all, there was a pretty dramatic gap between what leading organizations were doing and what other organizations were doing. Everyone was getting some impact, but there were two different kinds of impacts. Um, I would describe it simply as uh, most organizations were using technology to amplify the way existing work processes work, make their employees, get them connected to knowledge more quickly, make them more efficient at executing existing processes. But le leading organizations, we found, were actually thinking about how would you dramatically change the work processes, change the way talent was organized, and so forth. And we found that there were really a, not an infinite number of different patterns. 
when we, even though we looked at quite a few companies, it bunched into about six patterns. So we, we have a report out. I don't have time, obviously, to go into all these different patterns. I think each one is interesting. I'll just put, make this a plug for you to pull this off our website. Contact me, and I'll send you some of these case studies and the report about the different patterns. But the basic idea is changing the relationship between people and work. For example, moving decision-making further to the edge. Used to be that only centralized decision makers had enough information to make strategic decisions. Of course, they're removed from what's going on on the ground, so you had that disconnect. Now, information technology makes it possible for us to put information in the hands of the person on the ground, and you can move more decision making close to the edge. You can also do more replanning in real time. There's six key things. I'm going to talk mostly about the last one which I think is in some ways the most strategically disruptive, which is called work, we call workforce virtualization or the liquid workforce, which is replacing fixed teams of resources with ad hoc teams that are formed on demand. All right, uh, so that's one piece of context. Another piece of context which relates to this whole ad hoc teaming and so forth is a sort of social trend. And a number of people have been commenting this, a number of organizations uh, McKinsey is one of our competitors in some ways. Um, uh, I, I, I quote them here because they've actually done a, a good study on you know, statistics of how many more people are now acti acting in some fashion in a freelancer mode. The one thing I'd say is different about their conclusion and what I want to sort of leave you with here is they sort of almost lead you to think the future is going to be everyone's a freelancer. And you hear a lot of sort of discussion about, you know, the next startup that, that becomes a unicorn, billion dollar cap is going to have five employees. And um, I don't believe that, okay? I do believe there's a growth in that freelancer um, mode of working because some people want that and some people are forced into it. But I think in some ways what is going to be equally important, maybe even more widespread, is the growth of the freelancer mindset within the organization. And that's a big part of what I'm trying to promote. I'm trying to promote both because I think there's a, an advantage to both. But I'm especially interested, and we'll get a little into how we can promote that freelancer mindset and the opportunities that come along with having that mindset within the large organization and the way we can enable that with technology. Um, the one more trend that I'll, I'll try to touch on very briefly in the short amount of time I have, this emerged from some work that we did when we were at a recent meeting of, uh, another, another recent meeting about this topic, was we started to see that there is, I think one way to describe it is that automation is really going to have its primary effect on the workforce um, when it comes to the large industrial processes. A lot of large fixed processes are going to become increasingly automated. And we think the, the future of human workforce is in a much larger, more fragmented, more ad hoc, more fluid set of small processes. You know, I'd summarize it very briefly as robots are going to make the products in the future. Humans are going to be involved in customizing it for niche markets, providing services in and around it, gathering and analyzing data about it and so forth. So the nature of what people are going to do versus what machines are going to do is going to change. And that change itself is going to require a more liquid workforce. You're going to have to move from thing to thing. And, and um, it's going to be, in some ways, a more exciting kind of way to work. But it's also going to be one you're going to need to be prepared psychologically for. And we're going to need to support with uh, both technical and social infrastructure. So let me get down a little bit more into kind of against, I want to stress this idea that I think you need to attack the three levels at, together. So digital workforce and innovation, in my mind, is about the individual level with things like intelligent assistance, immersive experiences, for instance. One of the things we're working on in, a, in the lab right now is when, when you build the new version of the product, you want the service technician to be able to practice servicing that tech product before it's even been developed, before it's even been manufactured. Once it's designed, you want to create that immersive simulation and give an online tutor that can tutor you in that simulation. That's the future of how learning is going to be moved closer to the point of need 
And I think one of the points previous speaker made, it's that's the way to get effective learning. You move it closer to the point of need by either having the technician be able to bring something while they're on the job or being able to train them in a context where they use it right away in a simulation. At the team level, there's a lot of interesting different kinds of collaboration technologies also that are becoming very important, especially when you start thinking about the crowdsourced liquid workforce where you're throwing oftentimes strangers together to get something done. You're gonna need to have um, the, the mechanisms to support that team to hit the ground running and work effectively as a team. Some of that is about standardizing some cultural methodologies and so forth, but also there's technology that can help a lot as well. I'll just give a very brief flavor of that a little bit later. But I wanna spend most of the time talking about this third level, which is the organizational level. In today's world, the, the typical large organization, even the most capitalist free market company internally is typically organized kind of like a Soviet command economy, right? It may on the outside operate in the free market, but if you look at how it operates on the inside, there's, a, there's typically a five-year plan and a one-year plan and a quarterly plan, and everyone is assigned their role. And let's say my boss has something they need to get done, and there's someone really great in the company who would love to do it, but not on her team, I'm probably gonna have to do it, okay? We spend a lot of time in large organizations working on things because someone on our team needs to do it instead of it's the thing we're best matched to in the organization. And that's the idea of a market economy and that's the idea of what we're trying to create inside the organization. So one way to think about what we're trying to do is banish the org chart or at least reduce its influence, create something that looks more like a market inside and across the company boundary. So at the individual level again, a lot of what's happening is, it used to be when you sent someone out to fix something, technology changed so slowly, you could count on him knowing, you trained him to do it, when he got there it would be exactly what he trained for, you didn't change things very often, both because you didn't have technology changing, but also you couldn't because you could only put in there what he was trained to do. Now technology changes so fast you're gonna be dead if you do that. So you're gonna to have to send someone out there sometime and they don't know what to do, so they need to be able to learn while they're out there. So increasingly, technology is playing a role in combining things like step-by-step -step guidance, if it's not exactly what you saw, with connecting you with colleagues. You need, one of the roles of AI here to amplify and change the structure is to connect you to your colleagues who are the experts in what you're trying to do. One of the things we learned is, it doesn't necessarily mean the best expert in the company. They may be too busy, and they may not even be what you need. It may mean connect you to the last person that worked on that particular pump that you're trying to work on. So you could say, did you over tighten this here? Or is this how it's supposed to feel? And they'll remember whether it's supposed to feel like that. That's at the individual level. I'll, I'll skip the, t the, the team level for a minute. I'll come back to it later. Let's talk about the organizational level. It's where I want to spend most of my time. Um, what we're seeing again is a big change coming. From today's world, that's what's over on the left there, where people are in a department, inside a group, inside a division, and there's a strict hierarchy and a fixed, most work gets done by managers using a fixed team of resources that they own, to the world that's coming where the science of management is gonna change a lot, and the nature of being a worker is gonna change a lot, where most work will get done by ad hoc teams that are assembled on demand from a variety of different kinds of uh, online labor markets. And so you see the red, the purple, and the blue. It's because one of the things I really want to emphasize is that when you think about crowdsourcing, it's much more than just, most people think they have a sense of what it is, and they have one thing in mind, but they don't all have the same thing in mind. And that's because there's lots of different types. The three that I'm gonna emphasize here are internal, reorganizing how you use your own employees, External using public talent networks, and there are now dozens of vendors that are coming on the market with different kinds of talent networks available. Unlike Uber and Lyft, which are sort of competitors that do the exact same thing, the competitors, once you get to more complex work, are doing, they, they all are doing liquid talent of some sort, but their models are very different. Some are contest-based, some are uh, specializing in one kind of thing, some are general purpose 
freelancer market. So the science of management is going to really involve understanding what public talent networks you have available to you, what internal talent networks you have available to you, and being able to use those effectively. I was going to show a quick demo, but I, don't, I want to conserve time. So I'm just going to show a slide about it. This is something, just to make it concrete, this is something called Labs in a Box, which is a web portal we use. It's kind of a cool web portal. There's, there's nice videos. There's lots of navigation. It's what we use inside Accenture to explain what Labs does. Um, but if I showed it to you, it wouldn't, what it does is not different from other portals you've seen. What's interesting about it is not what it does, it's how it was built. So we, my small group was asked to build this, but we didn't have the capacity. Um, but we did have the expertise in crowdsourcing, so we crowdsourced it. And this was built uh, by a combination of basically 18 people, half of whom were crowdsourced from external talent networks, half of whom were crowdsourced from within Accenture, people who wanted to learn how to build a web portal but hadn't really done it before or who, who did do that but had another job but were willing to do something extra so they could get involved in labs. There's a, a range of different reasons people get involved. But the interesting thing is that we were able to do this using a hybrid team of internally and externally crowdsourced people. And it was this experience which both gave us confidence and the ability to do this and also led us to understand what a lot of the challenges are, which is where our R&D has been going, is to address those challenges. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I'm gonna tell you very quickly about the three journeys, the external one, the public talent network, oh, and I forgot to mention also privately managed external talent markets, which are people who are not your employees, but where you're gonna manage that crowd directly instead of using a third party vendor. Like for instance, imagine your alumni network. Right, where you may not to want to make that a public network. Accenture wouldn't want our competitors to have access to our alumni network, but we may want to be, get, be able to use them systematically so, through some crowdsourcing platform. So my group has deployed as a first customer within Accenture uh, a number of talent markets now. We now have about 140,000 people within Accenture that are in one of these talent markets where anyone in the company can post to it. Anyone in the company can register and take on work. There's no HR folks in intermediaries that, that there normally would be. The priesthood has been disintermediated. Um, and you can, you can form a team on demand. Um, and there are various incentives, which we could talk about later, uh, that we use to get people to participate. It turns out to be very easy to get people to participate. It's harder to get people to remember to post. And it's harder to get their managers to be willing to give them up, but having people participate, which we thought would be, a, you know, who, who want to sign up to do some work, we thought that would be the challenge. We often get multiple people responding to each post within an hour. Um, so we're, we're, we now are brokering about 35,000 hours of work a month through one of these talent markets. And we're starting to talk now, look at, in labs we have prototypes that also open this up to external talent networks. So, these are just internal within Accenture employees, but we have prototypes that now you can specify, oh, I'll take an internal employee or I'll take someone from Upwork or from some other talent market. So the, the, again, the way it looks is you just post. Anyone can post, anyone can um, browse. If your uh, talent profile matches a task, you'll automatically be notified that there's something that might be relevant to your interests. Um, and it, it's, it's quite active and working. Um, in terms of external talent networks, that's about building relationships with these third-party vendors. And so we've been building within Accenture um, a whole lot of relationships because there's lots of, as I mentioned, lots of different types. It's not about picking a winner in this space. It's about understanding what each one offers and how you build the tapestry correctly. So some are kind of like human in the loop computing with very small tasks that anyone can do. Some are very, very deep tasks like Google's got um, Kaggle, which is about deep data science problems. It's all over the place and, and in between. So we've been building the relationships with these and then piloting them, experimenting. How do you integrate those with the internal talent markets and your core teams to get the right mix of continuity and on-demand labor? We've been taking, in fact, with some of these, we've actually bought uh, minority interests in some of these companies because we think this really is uh, going to be at least a slice of the future. 
I should say, when I say we, I'm not speaking for Accenture as a whole. Uh, this is not an official talk with Accenture's official position. This is my position. Anyone, any one of my bosses seeing this, I want them to know that I made that clear. But we've done a lot of projects now using crowdsourced labor from external talent networks or hybrid teams that combine internal and external for lots of different kinds of work, ranging from strategy to technology and so forth. One of the things we found is you have to supply them with an environment that allows them to team effectively together. So a lot of our work is not just creating the talent market, but creating the environment that they're gonna work on, methods and tools, some of which we pull off the shelf and combine, some of which we have to build ourselves to allow an ad hoc team to work effectively. Um, we're also really interested, I, I know I'm running out of time here, we're also really interested in addressing some of the potential challenges. So one of the things that we're concerned about, um, Accenture in general, I, I think, is very committed to dealing with issues like equity in terms of gender pay gap. And one of the things, as we started to think about this gig economy, was would it make it better or worse? And I don't think the answer's in yet. We're trying to focus very heavily on creating technology that will at least keep it from making it worse. So we're doing things like creating tools that any crowdsourcing platform can use that will help close the pay gap, for instance, by giving transparency on what people with that skill profile typically get for that kind of job, so both sides can negotiate based on objective measures and reduce the gap between how the genders tend to negotiate, things like that. Just very briefly, this, this, a lot of our clients are now becoming interested in this external privately managed talent network, so they can have ad hoc labor mixed in to fill um, talent gaps. When you think about the future, I don't think you should think so much about uh, there aren't going to be jobs anymore. You're going to have to think really more about there's not going to be enough talent for all the new kinds of technology quickly enough to allow organizations to grow. And the complementary job that I have depends on us being able to do something that my company may not have in-house, and so being able to quickly get that talent and integrate it with the team is very important. So that's, I'll just, I'm out of time, I wanna summarize, again, this, just to repeat, I think we really need to understand how we help at the individual, the team, and at the organizational level, and how they work together. Because I think each leg of that stool needs the others to be effective. And so we're trying to attack that in an integrated way, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we, 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 are, we are seeing significant progress. We're also seeing that it's much more than a technology problem, and that's why I'm excited to be here with all of you, is that there's a, an organizational change issue, there's a, social, a set of social policy, even legal issues. We really don't have the right set of models at this point for, we have, you're either a, a contractor or you're an employee, and I think in the future, many people are gonna be somewhere in between, and we need new models to, uh, we need to disaggregate some of the things that come with employment and make them things that maybe are not commodified, as, as we were talking about earlier, but are part of the social contract more broadly, in order for this liquid to work without making uh, employees, uh, putting them at risk in certain kinds of ways. So I think there's exciting opportunities, there's lots of challenges remaining, and, uh, Happy to take a question if we have time. Thank you.